I'm so happy to introduce my great iconic prof, Dr. John Doyle. Uh, uh, he will present to us his distinguished and fascinating lecture, Management of Status Asthmaticus. Really, it is lethal and fatal condition if not diagnosed early, probably. Uh, uh, our great prof, John Doyle, always supporting the any scientific presentation, especially the e-learning. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was supporting us in the Monophia Anesthesia Club uh, previously. Uh, welcome, uh, our great prof. Uh, our great prof has a special interest in ENT, anesthesiology, difficult airway, pharmacology, and the technology in anesthesia. Uh, welcome, Prof. Jean Doyle, and sorry for the delay with you. Okay, welcome, Dr. Renjo. So yes. thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to speak on a very interesting topic, status asthmaticus. As I'll explain later, status asthmaticus is basically just severe asthma, and the term status asthmaticus is not used as commonly as it was in the past. There's a lot of material in this slide set, so anyone who would like a copy for their own use, please send me an email to djdoyle at hotmail.com, and I would be glad to send you a copy of the slides. I have a lot of material that uh, I'm going to cover, asthma pathophysiology, the difference between asthma and bronchospasm, how to assess the severity of, of asthma and a diagnostic approach. We're gonna talk a lot about drugs that may trigger asthma as well as some of the drugs available for the treatment of asthma and what constitutes a good or poor response. I also wanna talk about what happens when you have to take a patient to the intensive care unit. So the synopsis that I would like to offer you is that bronchospasm can result from excessive airway reactivity and it can be catastrophic. It frequently occurs at the induction of anesthesia, particularly around intubation, and many triggers may be responsible, including some medications. A systemic approach is uh, important to uh, understand how to treat status asthmaticus. And remember that not all that wheezes is asthma or bronchospasm. So asthma is more than just bronchospasm. There's an inflammatory process that we'll be able to discuss in a minute. So this illustrates the point that bronchospasm, increased mucus production, and airway inflammation and edema are all three things that may be involved in an asthma attack. In the case of bronchospasm, we have bronchodilators available to treat. In the case of increased mucus production, airway clearance techniques that we're all familiar with, and corticosteroids for the inflammatory process. Here we have an illustration of bronchospasm showing the narrowing of the airways, the increased airway resistance, and sometimes that results in the wheezing that we can detect clinically as well as by stethoscope. So bronchospasm is not necessarily asthma. Asthma is more than just bronchospasm, and bronchospasm is a symptom of asthma. People with asthma can get bronchospasm, but not everyone with bronchospasm gets asthma. Both conditions are the results of an irritated or inflamed airway. But asthma is the most common cause of bronchospasm. But remember that there are other things that can result in bronchospasm, COPD, dust, pollen, pet dander, exercise in the case of exercise-induced bronchospasm, chemical fumes and other irritants, including some perfumes, cold temperature, smoking, and some drugs used in general anesthesia that we'll have a chance to look at in a minute. So there are three inflammatory pathways in asthma that you may be familiar with, allergic inflammation, eosinic inflammation, and neutrophilic inflammation. And all of these work through these various cellular mechanisms illustrated here to result in airway smooth muscle contraction. In the case of eosinophilic asthma, one of the uh, less common ones outside of anesthesia, uh, um, in anesthesia, more common outside of anesthesia, eosinophils have been identified as a key mediator of airway inflammation in several asthma phenotypes. Here, eosinophils increase in the peripheral circulation accumulating the airway wall and the airway lumen, and it can, uh, activation of eosinophils contribute to airway uh, uh, eosinophil uh, degranulation with airway inflammation, mucus hypersecretion, and plugging. And as you can see in the bottom here, there are drugs specifically available for this, and these are typically of the monoclonal antibody type. The diagnostic approach to improperative uh, wheezing uh, results in 
understanding that there is wheezing on chest auscultation and in many cases, high airway pressures with positive pressure ventilation. Perioperative bronchospasm may involve an immediate IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction or a non-allergic mechanism triggered by intubation and other airway interventions. It may also be due to pharmacologic-induced um, effects via histamine-releasing drugs. So there's a differential diagnosis involved um, in the case of bronchospasm or wheezing. Uh, it may include inadequate anesthesia, reaction to airway manipulation like intubation, uh, drugs that may be responsible, uh, even um, esophageal intubation, kicking of the obstructed uh, tube circuit, pulmonary aspiration, pulmonary edema, pneumothorax. Unilateral wheezing suggests endobronchial intubation and uh, or possibly unilateral obstruction from a foreign body, such as a tooth. So there's a differential diagnosis to consider when you encounter wheezing and bronchospasm. The immediate uh, hypersensitivity that may occur is divided into non-allergic hypersensitivity called an anaphylactoid reaction where an immune mechanism is excluded and allergic hypersensitivity also called IgE mediated anaphylaxis where an immune mechanism is involved. The initial diagnosis of immediate hypersensitivity remains presumptive based on your clinical findings whereas the etiologic diagnosis is based on clinical features blood tests, particularly tryptase level measurements, and serum-specific IgEs. Postoperative uh, blood tests can also be carried out. To assess the severity of asthma, it's helpful to determine, to determine whether it's mild, severe, or life-threatening. Here, in mild uh, to moderate asthma, all of the features below are present. There's no cyanosis, there's a normal consciousness, good air entry, no marked tachycardia, no pulses paradoxes, normal speech and feed, uh, feeding. Predictive uh, a PEF is uh, greater than 60% and no previous ICU admission. Uh, but it gets severe if one or more of the following features are present, whether there is reduced oxygen saturation, elevated carbon dioxide tension, marked tachycardia, impaired speech, difficulty with feeding, a peak expiratory flow under 60%, uh, reduced air entry or previous IC admission. Any one of these predicts severe asthma. And finally, there's life-threatening asthma where you have cyanosis, desaturation under 80%, peak expiratory flow under 33%, poor respiratory effort, silent chest because air entry is so poor, bradycardia, dysrhythmias, hypotension, exhaustion, confusion, and coma. So this is a classification that can be useful, but it's worthwhile remembering that not all that wheezes is asthma. On the top, I show a metal nut foreign body left in the main bronchus, and below that, tracheal stenosis mimicking severe acute asthma. It's not uncommon that people with tracheal uh, stenosis, uh, for example, post -tra uh, tracheostomy, uh, will uh, end up with a diagnosis of asthma that's incorrect until uh, appropriate imaging and other clinical assessments are carried out. Now, after the endotracheal tube is inserted, you may get uh, bronchospasm and you wanna know whether it's allergic or non-allergic. So this is following endotracheal tube insertion, the most common uh, time at which bronchospasm occurs in anesthesia. If it happens before the uh, tube is inserted, it's likely allergic bronchospasm and uh, there may be cutaneous features associated with it, uh, such as urticaria. If it's after the tube is inserted, it's typically non-allergic bronchospasm and it's usually not associated with any cutaneous features. But it's worthwhile remembering that when bronchospasm happens after the induction anesthesia, one of the first things that you'll wanna do is to call for help and get extra pair of hands in there. If there is concomitant cardiovascular features like tachycardia and sometimes hypotension, consider IgE mediated anaphylaxis, especially if a neuromuscular blocking agent has been given or an antibiotic has been given. As I said, you wanna call for help They'll want to stop the anesthetics where possible, give 100% oxygen, epinephrine and fluid therapy is typically required, and IV methylprednisolone, typically a milligram per kilogram, can be given as secondary treatment. For uh, in the case where there's no inaugural cardiovascular features, it may be inadequate anesthesia, 100% oxygen, and then an inhaled short-acting beta-selective agent, um, such as uh, albuterol or salbutamol, can be given as well as IV methylprednisolone. And the secondary treatment uh, can also be given. And we'll have a chance to take a look at this 
This might include atrovent, ipratroponium, uh, or it may involve magnesium, both of which I'll discuss in just a minute. Now, status asthmaticus is an older term from what is now commonly known as acute severe asthma or severe asthma exacerbation. And it refers to an asthma attack that doesn't improve with customary treatments, such as inhaled bronchodilators, such as uh, albuterol or salbutamol. Many drugs may trigger asthma or bronchospasm, uh, aspirin, uh, um, uh, ASA, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory agents, beta blockers, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors like uh, neostigmine, some angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, some anesthetic agents, desflurane comes to mind. So Gamadex has been reported to do this as well, as well as some herbal uh, products. What is the emergency treatment for asthma? Well, you start with uh, drugs and then other things will be given as well. Commonly, we give short acting beta agonists like salbutamol or albuterol. Uh, albuterol is the American name for salbutamol. Intravenous corticosteroids, prednisone, methylprednisolone, uh, uh, epinephrine, ketamine, general anesthesia can also be useful. But don't also forget that uh, other things may be required. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may be required, intubation may be required, and even extracorporeal membrane oxygenation as a life-saving last measure. So here we have a schematic showing an illustration of the various uh, steps involved. You may start off with in, uh, initially with oxygen, salbutamol, ipratroponium, uh, or al uh, atrovent, some steroids, methylprednisolone, a milligram per kilogram. Uh, if that doesn't do the job, it may go down the way to uh, add ketamine and epinephrine and magnesium that I'll discuss in a minute. BiPAP, inhaled anesthesia uh, may be required. And in the worst case, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is illustrated on the left. The question is then, do you get a good response to your initial treatment or is it a poor treatment? Uh, a good initial response uh, includes no tachypnea, minimal wheezing, reduced or no recessions in the chest, reduced work of breathing, able to speak and feed, peak expiratory flow over 80%, saturation over 94% on room air. But incomplete or poor responses may include tachypnea, wheezing, recession of the chest, increased work of breathing, impaired speech, difficulty feeding, uh, PEF under 80%, saturation less than 94% on room air. And a poor response may be that you escalate up uh, your therapy. There is, as illustrated here, an enormous number of asthma drug therapy options available. Uh, you have short-acting beta agonists, of which salbutamol is among the most popular, anticholinergics, atrovent or uh, ipratroponium. We have uh, combination drugs, we have long acting beta agonists, and we also have corticosteroids as well as leukotriene receptor uh, antagonists that can be useful to prevent asthma. So we're gonna take a look at some of these drugs in their relation to anesthesia. In uh, metered dose inhalers, a bronchodilator is delivered via a pressurized canister, often in conjunction with a spacer device as shown on the bottom here. And salbutamol is by far the most popular of these. Uh, known as uh, albuterol in the United States. It acts on beta-2 adrenergic receptors to relax bronchial smooth muscle. Uh, for the treatment of acute or severe bronchospasm, it's advisable to do a nebulizer solution with a concentration of 2.5 to 5 milligrams every 20 minutes for three cycles, followed by repeat treatments, 2.5 to 10 milligrams every one to four hours based on your clinical findings. If you're using a meter dose inhaler, four to eight puffs of 90 micrograms every 20 minutes for up to four hours of standard practice, followed by four to eight puffs every four, um, one to four hours as needed. But you'll find in the emergency rooms, uh, in particular, the use of uh, nebulizer solution is particularly common. To administer a bronchodilator in an intubated patient, an albuterol meter dose inhaler cartridge can be placed inside a 60 cc plastic syringe as illustrated here. And here we show how it can be hooked up to the patient breathing circuit so that you're able to provide it to the patient uh, and you push down on the plunger of the syringe when positive pressure ventilation is taking place. And here is an article in the Saudi Journal of Anesthesia describing how this can be done, how you can make your own device if you don't have the appropriate attachment instantly available. Another thing that's sometimes done 
uh, is rather than using the traditional approach of an, uh, aerosol therapy is to administer liquid medications via direct installation to the tube. This is known as endotracheal liquid bolus. And I offer you an, an article describing how it's done. But the medication is injected directly into the endotracheal tube of a mechanically ventilated patient. Uh, and the patient is ventilated using a self-inflating bag valve device. Now, another drug, uh, Atrovent or uh, Ipratroponium, uh, it can be useful as well. It is two puffs four times a day, often used in combination with uh, salbutamol. Corticosteroids are commonly given in this setting as well. It's available uh, inhaled as well as intravenous, and methylprednisolone is among the most popular of these, typically a milligram per kilogram to start. Another drug that is sometimes used uh, and may play a beneficial role uh, is magnesium sulfate, two grams given over 20 minutes. And here are some articles to get more information on that should you want to add that to your treatment protocol. Now, an old drug, aminophilin, is no longer really used outside of pediatrics. A 212 Cochrane Review recommends that aminophilin should not be considered for use in acute adult asthma due to serious side effects and limited efficacy. There's just so many better drugs available than aminophilin, but it still may have a role in pediatric asthma. Ketamine, one of our uh, more interesting drugs in anesthesia, has bronchodilating properties, has been recommended for emergency intubation in status asthmaticus. So if you're going to intubate a patient, in status asthmaticus, ketamine may be the best drug to give, and all of us are familiar with it um, as a drug that we commonly use uh, in anesthesia, particularly uh, under special circumstances such as the hypotensive patient, uh, or sometimes given as an infusion as an adjunct to pain management. Epinephrine is another drug commonly used in the management of severe asthma. It has the theoretical advantage that uh, it acts on uh, it acts as a beta agonist that may decrease airway edema as well as provide uh, beta to agonism. Typically, this is given uh, by a nebulized uh, mask as shown on the right, 0.5 ml of 2.25% racemic epinephrine. Uh, uh, but you could also use, if that racemic epinephrine is not available, 5 ml of 1 in 1,000 regular epinephrine. It can also be given systemically where needed, intermuscularly 0.5 milligrams or as an IV infusion starting at five micrograms per, kilo, uh, five micrograms per minute and then titrating there. So uh, epinephrine can be very useful in that. Now, those who want more details about uh, therapy, I have this very complicated chart that I've included only for reference. I'm not gonna go through it, uh, but rather I'll, I'll discuss some of the elements of it in subsequent slides, but it shows you that there are many different options for the treatment of asthma. This would be, for example, a good poster to put up in emergency rooms where asthma is frequently encountered. Uh, sometimes with severe asthma, you have to intubate. Examples include cardiac arrest, profound bradypnea, respiratory arrest, physical exhaustion of the patient, severe hypoxemia despite maximum oxygen therapy, failure to reverse severe respiratory acidosis despite intensive therapy. And as I mentioned earlier, it's common in such a case to intubate using ketamine because it has its own bronchodilating effects. Many of these patients will have to go to the intensive care unit. So serial FEV1s or peak expiratory flow rate measurements can help guide if the peak expiratory flow rate or FEV1 uh, is between 40 to 70% of predicted after initial treatment. That suggests an inadequate response. And in such cases, patients with continuing clinical decline or less than 10% improvement in uh, expiratory flow rate or less than 40% of predicted should be considered for ICU admission. Patients with worsening respiratory failure, altered mental status, arrhythmias, uh, respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, or complications like a pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum all require ICU admission. Refractory hypoxemia and status asthmaticus should trigger a search for complications such as asthma, uh, such as uh, pneumonia, atelectasis, or barotrauma. One thing that uh, you'll frequently encounter uh, in uh, asthmatic patients is dynamic hyperinflation and auto peak. Dynamic hyperinflation occurs when uh, alveoli do not return to their resting FRC, functional residual capacity values at the end of exhalation. The residual pressure within the lungs is referred to as auto peep or intrinsic peep. And dynamic hyperinflation impedes venous return to the right atrium, decreasing cardiac output. And here on the right, we see an example of a chest X-ray 
uh, showing hyperinflation. The most effective way to minimize dynamic hyperinflation is to decrease the minute ventilation, even if this means an increase in arterial carbon dioxide tension, DCO2, a strategy known as permissive hypercapnia or controlled hypoventilation. Now, finally, when nothing else works, there is the possibility in uh, specialized centers for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. And there are a number of case reports where ECMO has been used uh, as a rescue therapy in near fatal asthma where no other options have worked. Uh, but this is a desperate measure, but it has saved a number of lives. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, watching, and I look forward to uh, anyone who wants a copy of this slide set uh, to send me an email at djdoyle at hotmail.com. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Doyle. Many thanks for this uh, outstanding lecture. Please, I have a question from my side. Um, have we any predict predicting factors uh, that may influence the incidence of severe uh, asthma, which is called previously status asthmaticus, as age of patient, sex, or any comorbidities that may make us predict that patient will have severe, uh, uh, severe uh, asthma or status asthmaticus? Um, so there can be contributing factors. One of the ones uh, in adults uh, is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and often it can contribute to exacerbation of asthma, particularly among smokers. And another predictor, of course, is uh, a, a patient who's previously had asthma attacks and requires continuing therapy, for example, steroids. Um, that can be an issue. And remember that uh, asthma is very common in the pediatric population. While many children outgrow asthma, um, in the pediatric population, asthma remains, unfortunately, very common. The good news is, is that we have uh, many more approaches to therapy than we had when I began in medicine 40 years ago, uh, we have uh, a number of things um, uh, now that we understand how eosinophils may be involved, leukotrienes may be involved. So the pathophysiology is becoming better understood than before. Okay. So it's a very interesting disease uh, and turns out it's not one disease, but several diseases in combination depending on the various etiologies. Yes, sir. Please, uh, if pregnancy can aggravate uh, uh, asthma, uh, I'm not familiar with that, uh, but that was something I would have to look up. But I'm not, I'm not familiar with asthma being an exacerbating factor. But uh, okay. Okay. Uh, as regards the ketamine, uh, sir, you mentioned Dr. Jung, Prof. Jung. Just lost our chin for a minute. Yeah. I, I, I asked about the role of ketamine in uh, severe asthma. Uh, yes, uh, ketamine, ketamine is turning out to be a very interesting drug because it is a bronchodilator uh, and it does support blood pressure uh, when you intubate. And so a number of authorities are recommending the use of ketamine for intubation uh, uh, in asthmatic patients and it's readily available. Uh, and uh, it's a drug that we have been familiar with since its introduction to the 1970s. So I would have, uh, I would have it available in my emergency card. I certainly would. Yes, uh, sir, you mentioned that it can be given without mechanical ventilation as a method of treatment, as infusion or inhalation. Okay, if the patient is hypoxic or hypercardic or uh, have uh, sympathetic stimulation, is it safe to have it without mechanical ventilation or is a method of infusion? treatment? During I'm sorry, for which, attack, which? I asked you about if a ketamine infusion can be used in acute asthma or status asthmaticus without the patient being mechanically ventilated and has a severe sympathetic stimulation because of hypoxia and the hypercardia. It can be Most used of the time when we're, we're, most of the time when we're in a setting where the patient is severe enough that ketamine is required, uh, they will be intubated and they will require mechanical ventilation uh, with special attention to keeping airway pressures under control. This may require permissive hypercapnia, as I've mentioned earlier. Yes. yes. Uh, so far. 
Dr. Hassan, Hello. you have a question? Yes, a please. Question? Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Uh, first okay. of all, uh, thank you for this informative lecture from uh, Dr. Uh, Doyle. I appreciate uh, this webinar uh, from uh, Professor Saad and uh, you are uh, best uh, of uh, the moderators. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Doyle about, I have one question and one uh, comment. The uh, comment about magnesium sulfate. You know that uh, we are working here in Saudi Arabia since 20 years and we are facing a lot of asthmatic patients because of the sensitivity and the allergy to the pollens. Yeah. And uh, we face a lot of status asthmatic as in the ICU and we are managing very well with magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is a fantastic drug in managing the status asthmaticus, either by uh, using uh, magnesium sulfate in the, as a nebulizer in the uh, circuit or by intravenous, by putting uh, one gram or uh, half gram in the, as a nebulizer and or giving uh, the magnesium sulfate by uh, intravenous. It is fantastic drugs and the patient uh, respond very well with magnesium sulfate. This is number one. My okay. question about the, we hear all of the time about the racemic epinephrine. I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Dr. Doyle and he is a pioneer in the pharmacology and in the drug uh, pharmacokinetics. What is the difference between racemic epinephrine and the normal epinephrine, please? Thank you so uh, much. So that is, a, that is a really good question and I don't have a good answer for you because there's not much in the literature. Uh, what has happened is that when racemic epinephrine is hard to get and people use regular epinephrine, uh, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, it works just as well uh, as a nebulized drug. Uh, but I haven't seen any randomized trials comparing racemic epinephrine with regular conventional, um, with, uh, regular conventional epinephrine. Uh, so that's something that would be interesting to study. Uh, going back to your magnesium, it turns out that magnesium is one of the most interesting drugs that we uh, are continuing to learn about. When I started out um, in medical school, uh, the idea that magnesium would be useful for anything other than use in obstetrics uh, was just uh, unknown. And now we know that it's good for cardiac arrhythmias as well as the treatment of asthma. Uh, so it, it's interesting that uh, over time, things as simple as magnesium, we're learning more and more about all the time. Uh, also with ketamine, we're learning more and more all the time. Not only is it useful uh, in the asthmatic patient, as I mentioned, uh, but it's now being used in uh, parts of the world, particularly in the United States, for the treatment of all things, refractory clinical depression. Uh, and it uh, works much faster than many of the other drugs that are commonly used for depression, like MAO inhibitors and, and SSRIs. So one of the things to remember is that some of these old-fashioned drugs are developing new uses all the time. And magnesium is uh, one of the ones that particularly fascinates me because of this. Uh, so uh, we're always learning new things. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I, 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 I just, uh, I mentioned uh, regarding to the racemic epinephrine. epinephrine. For myself, I, I'd like to know what is the composition? What is the difference of racemic uh, compared to the normal epinephrine. Why it is named racemic? Well, racemic is, is because it has, it, it has both the R and S forms. So as you know, some molecules are left-handed and some molecules are right-handed and they are, uh, have uh, R forms and S forms depending on their, what's called serality. Uh, and in some cases, only one, in, in some cases, only uh, one form is clinically active and the other one is not. Uh, so that's, that's, with racemic epinephrine, you have both forms. And with conventional epinephrine, you have only one form, as I understand it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that's I'm also true, by the way, that's also true, by the way, for ketamine. Ketamine uh, has uh, R forms and S forms. And one of the question is, uh, is one of the forms better than others for clinical use? And that's a subject of investigation uh, that we'll find out about more about in a few years. Uh, sir, I'm Dr. Simanja calling from uh, India, Delhi. Uh, my question 
to you is whether you people are using hydrocortisone in uh, acute severe asthma because we are because we are very uh, getting very few cases of acute severe asthma we are basically treating copd we are using hydrocortisone but as in your slides you mentioned only dexamethasone and methylprednisolone so whether hydrocortisone can be used Yes, hydrocortisone can be used, especially if methylprednisolone is not available. It's a matter of preference, and it's also a matter of uh, 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 administering the uh, calibrated dose. So uh, if you use the equivalent amount uh, of uh, prednisone, methylprednisolone, hydrocortisone, as long as you use the equivalent amount, uh, that should be fine. But most studies that I'm familiar with use methylprednisolone, but I think it's, uh, there, are, there are not studies available that compare one with the other in a randomized trial, which would be something that would be very helpful. But methylprednisolone being so common, commonly available, that's the one that's um, commonly used in emergency departments uh, in the United States. Uh, sir, my uh, last question is, suppose a patient uh, with acute kidney injury or the chronic kidney disease, is having bronchial asthma also having bronchospasm? So how frequently you can use magnesium because it's nephrotoxic also? Both uh, as in fuel, both uh, in IV form, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, most of the time when it's given, it's given in acute circumstances rather than chronically. And so the possibility of toxicity is reduced. Uh, so as, as, as to the nephrotoxicity, that's something that we would have to investigate. Yes. So, thank you, sir. We have a question from the floor, Professor Doyle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the best combination of uh, ketamine in uh, uh, severe asthma. Someone asked this question. The best uh, combination of ketamine in severe asthma. Well, you would be, you would be starting off with your typical um, beta-2 agonists, you would be starting off with, um, for example, salbutamol. Uh, you may be using atrogen. When you get to ketamine, you're going to be using ketamine primarily to intubate if, if it's that severe. Lower dose ketamine can be used for the treatment of asthma as well, but you have to remember that um, these patients can easily develop respiratory failure uh, and may require intubation, which is why ketamine is typically used for intubation in such a setting. Uh, but ketamine would not be used on its own. Typically, uh, you would go through that uh, escalating process that I illustrated, uh, and early on, you would be using inhaled drugs uh, as well as corticosteroids. He asked, yes, he asked about the combination of ketamine with what, what any of the drugs during the intubation of asthmatic asthma. Asthmatic patient. Oh, well, uh, you would probably be using ketamine in conjunction with a neuromuscular blocking drug. Uh, my, my preference would be rocuronium uh, because we have a specific antagonist for it. Uh, but remember that rocuronium itself has been associated with, as a trigger uh, for anaphylaxis, but that's true for all our neuromuscular blocking drugs. Okay. Some yes. people would intubate without uh, use of a muscle relaxant. Uh, yes. If you had an easy airway, that would make sense. Pardon, uh, but I think most people would, would use that, or you would use succinylcholine. Yes, sir. Uh, you, so, prefer, uh, you, prefer just, you prefer, sir, just ketamine plus neuromuscular blocker only for intubation of the patient when indicated? You mean that, I would say sir? that would be my preference. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, what about atracurium you should avoid? Well, uh, yes, I don't, because of its histamine properties, I would avoid atracurium. Uh, this atracurium, atracurium is, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, similarly, rocuronium also have a high chances of histamine relief, and it has shown anaphylaxis. So instead of that, it should, would not be better if you would have vacuronium like drug. So I don't know about that. Uh, certainly, Cisatracurium and atracurium in particular is associated with histamine release, less so for rocuronium. Uh, there are some people who would uh, prefer to use succinylcholine for intubation in such a setting. Uh, and in emergency departments, that would be a, a common choice as well. But now with Sugamidex becoming available, more and more people are using rocuronium. Uh, 
So I think it's, there's a lot of variation in how things are done depending on what country you're in and the availability of the various drugs. Yes, okay. Yes, very nice, very nice. Okay. We have no question, no other question. Uh, thank you, Professor John Doy, for his fascinating and outstanding lecture, highly informative. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's always a pleasure, of course. And we look thank forward you. to thank future you. presentations. Thank you. Thank, 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 you. thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the problem was uh, Dr. Amrahan is about to connect. Now now, now we will, we will uh, present, introduce uh, Doctor. I, I don't know if he uh, is able to do it or not. He's not here yet. He disconnected and he trying to reconnect with him again. Okay. So just give us a few minutes, please, to see okay. if he is able to okay. come. Anyone have another question for Prof. Doyle? Prof. Doyle, uh, we have a valuable chance to have him with us for more than an extended few minutes. Safa, I, uh, I heard, uh, Safa, I heard uh, about the question about magnesium sulfate nephrotoxicity, and uh, I am working with uh, uh, with uh, magnesium sulfate since long time in yes. neuroanesthesia, and uh, we are uh, first we uh, used the uh, magnesium sulfate in very high dose in eclampsia, so yes. the treatments in eclampsia we can use with three to six grams. Uh, every yes. six hours or every eight hours and know, nothing I happened and, and nothing happened yes, with the uh, page, with the parturients uh, regarding to nephrotoxicity so work. yes so yes. just to reply about this uh, question with the answer that magnesium sulfate when it is used in the treatment of uh, status asthmaticus it is used in very low uh, those, those uh, yeah. no, no, no more in, 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 in one time, no more than half a gram or one gram. And this is very trivial dose and doesn't affect on the uh, nephrotoxicity. Yes. Just, yes. just to clarify this uh, yes. Thank question. You. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Valuable qualification. clarification. Thank you. Yes, we, we yeah. have a question. He's not here yet. So I, I have a couple of comments that uh, would yeah. be of interest. Yeah. And yeah. the first is that uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is the final pathway for asthma that is completely refractory. The question is, among the people in the audience, how many of them have extracorporeal membrane oxygenation available as an option in their intensive care unit? Is that something that's only in the United States and a few other countries, or is it something that's becoming more common around the world? Uh, sir, we yes. have we ha sir, we have uh, used we have got one ECMO, and we have used uh, in uh, COVID COVID ARDS when it was refractory, but uh, we lost all cases, poor cases. We put the patient on ECMO, but nobody survived. I'm talking in second wave, uh, during, in 2020. So we have sir ECMO, but we have not used it for severe asthma. Okay. okay, and uh, uh, we have a question, Prof. Doyle, please. Okay, have a question from the floor. Someone asked about the role of lidocaine uh, uh, IV uh, in case of uh, severe asthma or status asthmaticus. Do you prefer it, sir, or have you experience with it? Uh, I had no experience with the use of lidocaine in this setting. Uh, what I would have to do is take a look at the literature and see what has come up and also to see what has come up uh, in various advisory panels. As you know, it's getting increasingly common that various national societies come up with recommendations for uh, management of various conditions so that there is the best use of science. Uh, and so we'd have to take a look at uh, what various councils, for example, uh, the journal Chest uh, and the American Thoracic Society have made a number of recommendations about a number of conditions. But I haven't seen lidocaine offered as an option in the uh, surveys that I've done. But remember this, we're learning all the time that some of the drugs that we use all the time have new unimagined uh, uh, uses. And now that we've discovered that lidocaine has anti-inflammatory properties that yeah. 
Yes. You would have thought we would have figured that out decades ago, but now it's clear that they have anti-inflammatory properties that can be very useful in general anesthesia and elsewhere. The anti-inflammatory properties of lidocaine, one might expect might be useful in the treatment of asthma as an adjunct. So one of the challenges we've got is we have so many options for treatment, which are the best ones and which are, are not so good. And what we need are formal randomized trials to sort this out. Uh, as an example, uh, when I was in medical school, aminophilin was the drug for the treatment of asthma. Uh, and then only uh, uh, after I'd finished medical school did uh, salbutamol or albuterol become commonly available and that changed the landscape. But now we're no longer recommending um, aminophilin as a treatment outside of the pediatric uh, setting. Okay. Uh, okay. The other thing to know is that asthma... Is, Sir, sir, please, uh, sometimes we inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube by trimal uh, lidocaine uh, to minimize the response to the endotracheal tube and to, to minimize the irritation of the upper airway. Is it right, sir? Uh, so uh, we commonly do that, of course, for awake intubations. Uh, I haven't seen that done much in recent years, but it was very common that we would give lidocaine Oh, 15, 20 years ago, everyone got lidocaine before putting in the tube. They would put in a lidocaine by spray and then put it in. I haven't seen that as commonly done in recent years, but uh, the 1990s, that was very common. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Amri, President.